Um, I'm really, really touched by what Rich had to say. Also by the honor uh, to be invited here to show my work. When, um, <clears throat> when they first asked me to do this, to, to present my films, I said, sure, yeah, I'm happy to do it. Um, I thought I just had to show the films and then Gina Duffy, who I have to thank, along with her staff, uh, Kelly and Marie, and especially uh, I want to thank um, Joanne Quinn, who did the wonderful display here and the wonderful poster. When uh, Gina asked me what I was going to speak about, um, I said, well, I really, my first impulse was to say I want to talk about, when thinking about Italian-American culture, I thought faith family and tradition. That, that was, I've been thinking about that because I have worked on this documentary for St. Nick's and um, that was the theme for their 100th uh, celebration, the 100th year celebration. But I thought, no, that sounds too vanilla. So I had to come up with something a little more exciting. So I came up with the title, uh, Italian American Identity, The Media, The Mafia, and The Message. But that didn't seem right either. So I thought, you know, that's like kind of focusing on the negative. And I, I couldn't get away from the faith, family, and tradition because that's really what I associate with Italian-American culture. So what I'm going to do, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to try to mix it up so I have a little bit of both. Um, <clears throat> the um, thinking about coming here and my experience in my parish of St. Nick's, I thought, what can I say at Villanova? Then I realized that St. Nick's was run by Augustinians, and that Villanova is run by Augustinians, so there, we'd have that at least in common. And I thought about, you know, what was important to our immigrant ancestors? I know, like, for my grandparents, uh, they always stressed education education, learning, learning. And I think they saw it as a way to get out of the poverty and ignorance, but also to make a better life for yourself. And then I kept thinking about that word education. Now we here in English, we use it in, in America, we use it to mean going to school. But in Italian, educazione also has that connotation, but it also means it has a other meanings. It talks about your, it means your upbringing. It means having good manners. It means being courteous. And this is everything that I associate with Italian culture and Italian American culture specifically. Um, I went to St. Nick's grade school. I went to Bishop Newman High School. So I, I had all this Catholic uh, training for, for 12 years. And by the time I got to college, I didn't want to have anything to do with anything Catholic at all. But oddly, um, I kind of started to study world religions and I kind of found my way back to my, my own faith. And, and that came when I actually looked up the word. You know, I realized and that I never knew what the word Catholic meant. You know, it's a, it's a sect of Christianity and Christianity is part of the Jewish diaspora and we're all, you know, inextricably tied together. But that I never knew the, what the, the meaning of the word was until I looked it up. And when I looked it up, I was surprised and happy to find out what the meaning was. And I suspect many Catholics don't know what it means either. And it means free from provincial prejudices, all embracing. And I thought, that's really, that's really what the, our training was. It's to embrace everybody. And of course, you know, we all have been mortified and dismayed by the scandals in the Catholic Church and we all recognize that the Church is in dire need of reform and I think a lot of us are really, really happy that um, Papa Francesco seems to be the guy to make it happen. Although, um, I don't know if you guys saw the news yesterday where they reported that uh, in his younger day he was a bouncer. <laughs> So <laughs> I think that comes from his Italian side. <laughs> but I can't imagine him as a bouncer, him at, him at the door of a club. He probably was just a doorman, and, and he probably didn't hold that job for long. I could see somebody coming up, your ID, please. 
You don't have it? All right, next time, take it. Go ahead, go on it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but I think, um, you know, what we think about uh, with, with the new pope, and the hope is that we'll have a return to our roots. I don't know how, if any of you out there saw uh, Paolo Sorrentino's new film, uh, La Grande Bellezza. Have anybody seen it? Just raise your hands. No? It's, um, he's like one of the premier directors uh, in Italy right now. And it stars the, the great Tony Servillo. But there's a scene in there. Uh, Tony Servillo plays Jeff Gambardella, who is this world-weary uh, guy who's um, you know, jaded and he's seen it all and he's pretty cynical. But he encounters a nun, uh, a missionary nun, who tells him at one point, and it really shakes him up and it shook me up when I saw it in the film, that the roots are what's most important. And I think that's really what we need to get back to, is the roots, the, the, the principles that we were taught, and, and those all-embracing, free from provincial prejudices, those kind of principles are important. And it seems today, especially um, for Christians or Catholics and people of any faith, I think there's a strong um, a streak of atheism going on that uh, kind of uh, poo-poos or snickers at people who are strong in their faith. And I think that's a mistake because every culture and every country in the world, um, everybody recognizes that, every faith recognizes that there's something bigger behind working uh, in the background that we're all connected to. And I think it's, it's um, presumptuous to assume that it's something that's superstitious or old-fashioned or doesn't relate anymore. Um, <clears throat> a wise writer said um, that ideals, the ideals that we, we carry, you know, in the journey of our life, our ideals are like the stars. We use them as guides. We know we can never reach them, but if we use them as guides, we'll get to our final destination. And I think that's really important when discussing the fullness of what our humanity is about. Um, it seems like I'm going on on a, a spiritual topic, and, I, and that's purposeful because the first film that I want to show you is um, a celebration of St. Nicholas of Tolentine uh, Parish in South Philadelphia of their 100th anniversary as an Italian national parish. It was set up, as you'll see, to deal with the immigrants who came and to try to address not only their spiritual needs but their material needs as well. And they're still in operation. Uh, it's, I'm proud to be a member uh, of that parish and um, it's the last place if you want to stay connected to Italian culture uh, and the Italian language. It's the last place in the city of Philadelphia where you can hear a mass in the Italian language. Um, and I'm afraid, you know, as the, the immigrants who, who come to the, to the Mass, as they, you know, pass on, that uh, that's going to even disappear. But that's another aspect of culture that we could talk about um, in the future, the, uh, uh, it, further on down the line. Uh, the other important thing about our training as Italian-American Catholics was uh, the notion that everybody is has the opportunity for redemption. You know, I think that's so key to who we are and what we are, that we recognize that no matter how bad we mess up, there's a way um, that we can get back. We can get back to a healthy spirit, a healthy state of mind. So uh, with that, I'm going to show you the St. Nick's um, documentary. It's about 10 minutes long. and. Um, we can talk about that later. At the end, we could do like a Q and A if, if that's what you guys are. If anybody has questions. <coughs> Well, you know, looking back at the history of St. Nick's, 
I think about what does it mean today, especially today, to be Italian or Italian American. Um, I think you know, people would say, is it about the food? Is it about the music? the traditions. Um, I remember growing up looking at my immigrant grandparents and I recognized that they were different. That they were simple, simple people, but they had that love for us and kind of protectiveness for us that, you know, really stayed with us for, uh, for the rest of our lives. And, um, you know, working in university and being, uh, um, getting connected with people from different cultures, different backgrounds. One of, the, one of the criticisms that I hear about, especially about Italian-American culture, is that, it's, that Italian-Americans are nostalgic or too nostalgic or overly um, concerned with filial piety. You know, I, I, I think that's primarily like an ang Anglo criticism. It's not something that we feel. I think that for us, looking at our, our, where we came from is really important. I know like with my brothers and sisters and my cousins who showed up tonight, we talked about when we were young and we tell stories about the old days and it kind of gives you a sense of who you are and where you came from. It gives you a sense of place. Um, <clears throat> one of the other um, aspects or criticisms is that, you know, that looking back is an impediment, and yeah, it is if you keep, if all you do is look back. But I, I look at it like it's the rear view mirror, you know. You see what you check every once in a while to see where you're coming from. And I always, I found personally that when you come to an impasse, in, 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 when I came to an impasse in my life and I didn't know what decision to make, it was really looking back and seeing that line of ancestors and the sacrifices that they had to make for me to be where I, I am. And usually, you know, absent of any other kind of uh, um, solutions, the solution I always find is that line, that long line that brought me here, well, if I just draw a through line into the future, that, that was like a helpful key to make, to, to make the next step. And so, to me, I don't think uh, looking back is necessarily a bad thing, as long as it's done in moderation. <clears throat> um, most of us Italian-Americans, uh, that's our only connection to Italy, you know, is our ancestors and that ancestral experience. And um, that's, that's very valuable for us. A lot of native Italians don't understand that. Um, <clears throat> also, the thing about family life, uh, growing up in um, a working class family with a lot of people, you, you find that, you know, there's a lot of love there, but there's a lot of chaos, a lot of craziness. Um, but all that, in the end, is all part of what makes us who we are. And even though you have arguments and fights, you're still family and you still stick together. And I think that's, that's an important thing for us. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a dear uncle who passed away. He used to ask the rhetorical question, what, what is a dysfunctional family? And you know, you think about the craziness that went on. I, I think about the craziness in my family. And I'm, some, I'm sure some of you <laughs> had the same experience. You think about that and you say, yeah, it was dysfunctional. But then he would follow up the question with another one, which was also rhetorical. And he would say, well, can you name a functional family? And I, I couldn't do it. I didn't know anybody. I, I, I suspect they're out there. I, I, you know, I, I think of that line that Jack Nicholson uses in As Good As It Gets about uh, uh, some people have you know, great families and they have, what is it? macaroni salad, <laughs> you know, it's, but it's not that, it's not just that. Um, so, to sh I want to sh show you the next clip, and we're going to kind of go uh, with this clip from the sacred to the profane. Uh, <clears throat> this is a clip from Federico Fellini's Amarcord. Now, Amarcord in Fellini's uh, regional dialect means love to remember. 
And the whole film is his looking back on his life and everything that brought him to where he, wa he was. And the scene I'm going to show you um, is full of ambi ambiguity. Not ambiguity in the sense of confusion, but ambiguity in the sense that there's multiple layers of meaning. There's multiple things going on, and they're all true at the same time. This clip that I'm going to show you from Fellini's film is profoundly sad, but at the same time, it's hysterically funny. So, um, one other item just to set it up. It takes place at a dinner in the kitchen where a lot of Italian and Italian-American action takes place. Um, the father, who's the head of the family, is the foreman on a construction site, and he tends to run his family that way. He's very intolerant of uh, sloppiness and imperfection. And the mother, who's the heart of the family, um, she's nurturing the kids, uh, especially her two sons, uh, who are not quite as good as she th thinks they are. They're mischievous. They're not bad kids. And she also uh, uh, fawns over her adult brother who doesn't have a job, who is worried about what he's going to eat and making sure that his hair is kept in place. Also the <laughs> grandfather lives at home and he's at the age where he's lost all filters. So I'll leave you with that. <coughs> so. The answer to the question, is there such a thing as a functional family, uh, I don't think there is. I think, you know, the truth is that nobody, none of us are perfect. Uh, we're all damaged goods um, to a late, greater or lesser degree, I think, um, but we're all still goods, and those, the, the good that's in us could be redeemed and could be reworked. and could be made healthy again. I, you, I mean, you got to have faith and believe in that, otherwise life doesn't make sense. Um, one of the things that struck me is the similarity between Italian-American and Native Italian culture. I think a lot of my Native Italian friends uh, say, oh yeah, yeah, that was my house too. And I think about all the things that we have in common, and, and that is this long literary, uh, visual, and oral tradition, uh, storytelling, family especially, um, that, that, that's what makes up our shared culture. And it's always either literal or symbolic. You know, I think the, the great thing about this scene is that you think about it, it's really very, very sad that what, what they have to go through, but especially the parents, but they do it because that's what that's what families are. But the difference, I think, between um, contemporary Native Italians and um, Italian Americans is that we've been so far removed from Italy, the Italy that Native Italians uh, ha or have experienced uh, up until recently, especially ones that have come here, that most of our ancestors came over in that first big wave from 1880 to 1920 to make their new lives here. But the ones who stayed um, very shortly afterward in 1922, Mussolini came to power and fascism. So they were all under the thumb of the fascists for all that time, right up until the end of the war in 1945. And then during that time, also in Italy, um, the communists came to power. Now Italian Americans who are Catholic say, how could Italians be communists. The, the Catholic Church convinced us that that was uh, a sacrilege to be communist and you can't be communist and Catholic. At least that's what we were uh, indoctrinated here to believe. Um, but the reality is that we're, we're all connected to the same roots. Italian Americans are just a, new, a newer branch coming from the same tree. Uh, but we all have, we all share the same roots, and that root, those roots go back to uh, Greek and Roman times, all the way up. All the atrocities, all the good things, all the great things about cultures, all the invasions um, and 
and um, horrible things that happened, as well as the good things. And that's really, I think, what makes us human, the recognition of all that. And that's what I, you know, I hope to get out here in the work, that we could see that. Um, <clears throat> for us, I think Native and um, Italian Americans, Native Italians and Italian Americans, that art and storytelling uh, is as important to us as food. I think, you know, it really feeds our souls. We need to tell stories. I think it's strong in us, and every culture has a strong storytelling tradition, whether it's oral or written, or now in the 21st century, we're uh, visual primarily. Um, <clears throat> and it wasn't until, um, you know, we had these kind of images of Italians up until the 70s, when Francis Coppola came out with his great works of art, the, the Godfather films, uh, and then in, in the 80s with uh, Scorsese with, with Goodfellas, and then in the late 90s, early 2000s with The Sopranos, David Chase's series. Um, these kind of help um, perpetuate the, the I in their own way, and I don't think in Coppola's way, I don't think he was trying to show or depict Italian Americans as this, he was trying to show why they were this way. Why, you know, Sicily, I think even in Godfather 3, there's a, there's a line uh, where Michael, where Kay asked Michael, why do you love this country? Why do you love Sicily? And he said, you know, these people have been invaded by every um, colonizing army and nation, and yet they still choose life. And I think that's, that's really key to part of what this Italianness is that we talk about, that we feel, that we recognize in, in, in the works. Um, so in dealing with this, in the when the, the stereotypes got really, for me anyway, got to a point where I felt I needed to do something to address them, uh, most of my Italian-American friends said when The Sopranos hit, that's it, this is the last straw we got to write HBO, we got to get them to get this off the air, they wouldn't do this with blacks, they wouldn't do this with Jews, they wouldn't do this with other people, but they feel that they have a free pass to do this, uh, to perpetuate these stereotypes about Italians. And I thought that's the wrong way to go about um, dealing with this. You don't, you can't legislate the human heart, you can't change hatred by creating a law, this is my belief to stop them, because all it does is it makes people who are prejudiced and bigoted go underground. So when they're with their own group, they could tell all the jokes that they want. And, you know, and I think, so for me it was, that wasn't the way to approach it. So when I, I thought, how can I deal with this? How can I deal with the stereotypes in a way that would make people think before they just assume something? So that was what um, was the impetus behind uh, the creation of this short film called Tiramisu, which I made in 2002. And I, I, I just want to say a couple things about it before I, I put it on. One, Tiramisu is, um, everybody knows it as the dessert, the delicious dessert we all enjoy. But in Italian, Tiramisu means pick me up or lift me up. And it's the name of the dessert because usually after a heavy meal, you have tiramisu, it's got espresso in it, it gives you a little jolt. But this notion of picking up and lifting up and helping uh, someone who's down, I think was really important for me anyway in, in the making of the film. And the other thing I want to say is, since it was made in 2002, that's 11 years ago, there's one an anachronism I want to point out right at the outset. There's a scene at a gas station and uh, there's a guy complaining about the price of gas. The gas, the gas is now double of what it was back then. So uh, I'll put that on, and then um, we'll go to a, come to a conclusion. And anybody who has any kind of questions about any of the clips, uh, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Okay. Well, before. Uh, I say anything more, I want to take this time to introduce uh, a very fine actor, my good friend, 
Harry Filibozin, who played Don Camilo. Harry, will you stand, please? And now the next obligatory question is, uh, did anybody not understand what happened there? <laughs> I, I, that's one of the, uh, I get confusion, so it's very normal, don't think that, that it's a problem if you didn't understand what you saw. Now everybody got it? No? You did? I didn't tell me. What happened? <laughs> what did you see? I saw the Don become the, 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 uh, the priest. Now, he became the priest, or was he always the priest? Uh -huh. Don Camilo. In, in Italy and in Spain, um, the, the honorary title for a priest is Don. But here in the United States, when you hear Don, you right away, the first thing you think of is the mafia. You don't think of anything else. There was not a curse word in there. You didn't see a gun. There was no gratuitous violence. There was no gratuitous sex. There was nothing to make you think that these people were mafia people, except our culture, the American culture that promotes those stereotypes. So they, when he didn't want to marry her, he didn't want to marry her as a priest. And any, anybody know why he didn't want to marry her as a priest? Huh? Nobody? No? She was pregnant? Possibly? He was secretly in love with her, yeah. And he had made, he had his vocation, and Don Camilo tells him, you can't do this because you made a vow already, and you'll, if you do this, you'll set a bad example. Una bruta figura in Italian, he tells him. And he realizes. Now, Tony's the, young, he's the youngest priest, so his hormones are still raging, and he's still <laughs> questioning his, his, uh, you know, his vocation. And the older priests know this, and they kind of you know, try to help him out to lift him up. So that was... Uh, that was um, the intention of it, and uh, even my mother, when she saw this, she said, I don't get it. What are those mob guys dressed as priests? <laughs> so, but um, it, was, it was fun making it. It's, I can't believe it's already 11 years since we did that. Um, but the idea was to address these issues of stereotypes, to make us question ourselves, and I think, you know, you, we think about our own stereotypes. When you see that, you say, wow, it's, it's in me, too. You, you know, we were very careful to walk the line of ambiguity, to be, you know, he's just, in fact, when Harry and I were working, I was directing him, I told him, I said, Harry, this guy is just a man in authority. You, that's all you have to think about. You don't have to shade him any other way. He's just a man who has authority. And he did a great job with it, so. Um, thank you, thank you. Well, I think that's pretty much all I want to say. I, I want to, in, before I conclude, I just want to make sure that I thank um, everybody here at Falvey Library, um, Gina, Marie, Kelly, uh, John, uh, and um, the, our, our great graphic designer, Joanne Quinn, who made the poster. And also I want to say that um, the gift, the endowment of the Manella family, uh, I think that kind of generosity has to be recognized. And I hope that Italian Americans who have the f financial capability will follow their example because, you know, we need, we need to promote positive images of Italian Americans in, in this culture and to develop the new products which have become our cultural legacy in the future. Um, the poet, Italian-American poet Robert Viscusi uh, said that culture seems to be a memory palace and that's where all our treasures are stored in, in this memory palace and I like that poetic way that he framed it um, because cultural identity, who we are, uh, it's it's a living thing. It keeps growing. It transforms over time and place. Um, 
at its best contributing positively to the benefit of all people in an all-embracing way, free from, hopefully free from provincial prejudices and concerns. So thank you. Thank you.